right, welcome to class. Starting a little late today. Um, today's lecture is titled, could have been titled anything, but I'm calling it uh, Simulation Evidence. It's in general just more, some more exposition on, in general, some more exposition on the church string thesis itself. So basically, like, um, we talked last time about uh, Turing machines. We gave a definition of a Turing machine. And then we gave some, uh, like, uh, intuition about the Church-Turing thesis. And the Church-Turing thesis says that the Turing machine is an ideal computer. It's an ideal model of uh, what a computer is. And the action performed by a Turing machine is itself uh, computable. What is the intuitive notion of computable is exactly that which a Turing machine can do. We also presented um, Turing's, uh, the section of his original paper called The Direct Appeal to Intuition, where it gives, a, I think, as solid of an argument as you can about why uh, the church Turing thesis is true and correct. Um, today we're going to give a more classical argument in favor of the church Turing thesis. So basically, like, what happened um, historically was, like, Alan Turing came up with the definition of what we now call a Turing machine, and then he came up with what we now call the Church Turing thesis. And he did these to solve a problem, and we'll talk about ex extensively what that problem was that he solved. But basically, he solved this very famous open problem at the time. He gives, the paper goes to review, there's actually some errors in it, it turns out, but it goes to review, it goes to von Neumann. And uh, if you've heard of von Neumann, maybe very famous, now American, um, mathematician, founder of computer science, quantum physics. He worked on the Manhattan Project. He was reviewing Turing's paper, and he actually could not believe that the definition of a Turing machine that was so simple could encapsulate all natural computation. He could not believe that the solution was that simple. And so what he did is he was working through trying to uh, argue to himself if it was correct or not. He came up with several variants of the Turing machine. He strengthened it. He made generalizations of it, and then it turns out that they were all equivalent to the Turing machine. So in the same spirit of that, of what he did, we're going to do the same thing today. We're going to generalize the definition of a Turing machine several times. The Turing machine is quite weak, right? It has a conditional read, write, and move. That's it. Can't do anything else. Um, we're going to make several generalizations of that definition, try and create stronger and stronger Turing machines, and we're going to fail. Each, def each generalization we make is going to end up being equivalent to the Turing machine. So in some sense, that is what is the simulation evidence. That is the evidence in favor of the Church-Turing thesis. That, sure, the Turing machine is a computer, fine. Um, but if you can make, can you make a stronger one? And it turns out any, several attempts to make a stronger one uh, fall back uh, to the ground. Right? So um, let's uh, just, uh, I guess, jump right into the... Uh, uh, examples. So if you have, recall that a Turing machine has like a um, uh, transition function that looks like this. It takes, it takes a single state, it performs a read, then it moves to a new state, uh, performs a write, and then moves uh, left or right. So that's the, definite, that's the transition function of a Turing machine. Uh, it goes from state to state, and as it does so, it performs a read, a write, and a move. That is the definition of a Turing machine. But you may ask, you know, having, being forced to move is kind of seems limiting. So what if we define what's called the stay TM, so a Turing machine with stay, so it's called stay TM. And it's going to be exactly the same. We're going to have the exact same definition, except we're going to allow the transition function to look like this. So we're going to re go from some state. We're going to read a symbol off the, uh, wherever the tape head is. We're going to go from a new state, write a symbol, and instead of just moving left or right, we allow the Turing machine to have this stay instruction. So what that means is the Turing machine can, the difference between these two models, certainly, is that the Turing machine, the normal Turing machine is forced to move left and right, as the way we've defined it. Uh, and the stay Turing machine is, we allow it this extra instruction here where it's allowed to stay put. Uh, when we gave the direct appeal to intuition, when we gave his uh, Turing's argument, we made several um, 
uh, restrictions, like the opposite of a generalization. You know, we went from a two-dimensional book to a one-dimensional tape. We made some restrictions on the generality you're allowed to do perform on that tape. So it's not obvious that the definition that we specifically gave is the best one. It'll turn out for proofs and things when you the, the definition uh, given in the Sipser book and the definition we gave is written by like a lawyer. So it's it, it is the most useful definition of a Turing machine. It turns out to use for proofs, but this certainly is a different definition of a Turing machine. Slightly, it allows it to stay put. Yes. So you're saying that these two are the exact same. So like what we want to prove is that these two are the same. We need to prove it. Okay. So first off, what would you say is the relationship between a Turing machine and a state TM? Or what is the obvious relationship between the Turing machine and this Turing machine with state? Well, it just modifies the little tape, and it can move based on where it's on the tape. So it's like the same thing, but just like... Sure, right. So Because this one's a warm-up. I'll say it this way. So like, let LTM uh, be the class of languages recognizable by a Turing machine. Certainly, every Turing machine is also a Turing machine with stay. Right. Ignoring so the state. Left and right. Exactly. So just okay. ignore. If you have a Turing machine that always moves left and right, it's also a Turing machine that always moves left and right and stays just by not staying. So every Turing, every language recognizable by a Turing machine is also recognizable by a Turing machine with stay. So it, this also means that every Turing machines can also make languages, right? Like sorry, what? It can generate things. So there is a definition of computation. Like the, we have a, we have a, we say a Turing machine is allowed to decide a language or recognize a language, or we allow a Turing machine to compute some function. But for now, let's not think about the computation definition because it turns out it just gets really messy. Okay, Real so quick. we're only thinking about decidable languages here. Yeah. So okay. think about. Don't think about a Turing machine yet. That is a. It turns out it's going to be the same. Don't think about a Turing machine that computes something for us, that calculates for us. Think about it just says yes or no. Okay. So this Turing machine, these are the Turing machine. Anything that is, this Turing machine says yes or no. Turns out that Turing machine is also a Turing machine would say says yes or no. So it might appear that the Turing machine is more powerful. Excuse me, the Turing machine with stay is more powerful than the normal Turing machine. We're just using some set uh, arithmetic here, right? So this is certainly this is a, a larger class, but is it a strictly larger class? Turns out no. So this is the first uh, uh, example. We're going to prove that even though this is a generalization that this is true, that every language decidable by a, uh, excuse me, recognizable by a state TM is recognizable by a normal Turing machine without uh, the state operation. This is not obviously true. This first part, obviously true. Second part, not obviously true. Why is it not? It's not obviously true because you've given a Turing machine with stay. It may use that stay in some important way. And it's not obvious you can just remove it. But I claim there is a way to convert any Turing machine with stay to a Turing machine without, and that the stay instruction is unnecessary. So what, how, if I gave you a Turing machine with the stay instruction, how would you convert it to a Turing machine with, that does not use the stay instruction? There are no like epsilon transitions, right? Nope. This isn't like a... Uh, yes, the Turing machine is explicitly deterministic. It's boring okay. and nice. Can you give us like... An extra 10 seconds. To yeah, 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 yeah. Let's, 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 let's let this one. Uh, this is a good one to warm up with. And this is the theme of today. We're going to make generalizations and show that they fail to be stricter. And this is like part of the church Turing thesis? Yes. So we can't use a church Turing thesis for today's lecture yet because we're trying to give evidence in favor of it. But I'll explain how you can just kind of wave your hand and not have to think about the simulation, but we need to give evidence in favor of it first. But yes. the point is that the church Turing thesis states... Like this idea that all Turing machines are the same? Like Yes. Okay. All models of computation. The Turing machine, it says many things. One way is to say the Turing machine is a good model of computation. It does naturally in class. It does naturally uh, encompass and characterize the idea of what is naturally and intuitively computable to us. And if you and there are attempts to generalize it which fail, basically. That's what uh, you a stronger computer turns out just get, gets more complicated. It doesn't get strong. It doesn't get more powerful. It just gets more complicated. So this is a first warm-up example. So how would you convert a stay TM to a Turing machine without stay? It has a conditional read, write, and move. So the normal Turing machine reads a symbol, writes a symbol, and moves left to right. So this machine moves left to right, but is allowed to stay. 
Well, stay put. Can you overwrite like a symbol with the same symbol? Yes, absolutely. And that is just moving without reading. Excuse me, moving without writing, certainly. You could have this instruction, read A, write A, move left. That will not touch the symbol, and it will move. So if you change a symbol, and then you move to the left, then you just read the same symbol, and then you can just move to Perfect. the right afterwards. Right? And just to be technical here, the definition of a Turing machine that we've given, the tape goes rightward. So yeah. there's, I'm going to actually move right and then left instead of left and right. So the idea, the high level idea here is that a stay instruction can be simulated by moving left and then moving right. But what if you want to rewrite, like, so if you have to read something and then it's like, let's say you overwrite like an A with like A prime, but then you want to overwrite any A prime that you see with like B prime or like something like that, would that still work? Sure. The way we're going to prove it, it's going to work is we're just going to convert the stay instruction to a sequence of other instructions. Okay. So just to give you an example, suppose we had, we were at QI, we read an A, uh, we write a B, and we move, we stay. Suppose we have this as an, an instruction. Suppose that's an instruction in the stay Turing machine. I'm going to convert this to an, a sequence of L and R instructions. And therefore, that'll show that every stay TM is a normal TM. QI, read A, write B, and instead of staying, we're going to move right. Add a dummy state. We're going to read A, write the A, move left, read B, write the B, move left, read the blank, write the blank, move left. So whatever it is there, we're going to ignore it. Oh, and then you just end up where you were. Exactly. So here you go QI to QJ, but the tape head stays the same. Here you go QI dummy QJ, but you first move right, then you are at the dummy state, then you ignore whatever symbol is on the tape head and just move left. And you just restart. Exactly. So this is a sequence of left and right moves, which is identical to the sequence of, which, uh, of a stay instruction. So do we add a dummy state, or do we just treat the next state as a dummy state? I think we need to add the dummy state, because you don't want to do something messy. Like, what if there's self-loops or something okay, complicated? Okay, so we add a dummy state after each state. Sure. Okay. So to finish this proof here, we would say, okay, given the stay Turing machine, take every transition of a stay, add a dummy, add a dummy state, and uh, convert the state transition to this transition. If a transition was already a left and right move, just leave it alone. Then the Turing machine is now with Turing machine with state is now a Turing machine without state. So therefore, this is a this is a simulation essentially. We've converted the state TM to a normal TM, and that have sh that has shown uh, that we have this set inclusion. So therefore, the things recognizable by a state TM, uh, anything recognizable by a state TM, turns out is recognizable by a Turing machine. Turing machine. Therefore, the state TM is not strictly more powerful. We have a double set cont containment, and they can only be equal. That's the that's the takeaway here. So this was a, a, a kind of a warm-up example of a, of a, of a state Turing machine. Um, we mentioned last time, kind of very briefly, that like the, the Turing machine tape looks like this, right? So you have it goes infinitely in that way, right? And then you have a sequence of cells on the tape, and then you have some like some like tape head, and then some. Something like that, and the tape head is allowed to read and write and move on the tape. Uh, the way we would define the tape, though, is one-dimensional. Uh, excuse me, it's one-dimensional, but it's one-way as well. Um, what happens if we allow a two-way tape? So let's say we just let the tape go this way. So now the tape is bidirectional or two-way. So this is the definition of a two-way tape. So this just means that there are states or Q0, or like... Uh, there is, the states are going to stay the same. The definition of the states is going to stay the same. The tape, we will allow to go this way. Before, we had a first cell. Okay, so there is no first cell. Like yes, that's, exactly. That's Consider it's a difference between the naturals and the integers, basically. There is no least element. There is no first cell. Same thing. You can now loop infinitely that way or infinitely that way. Um, so this is called a bidirectional or two-way uh, tape. First off, why is it true... Uh, that this Turing, that the class of languages dis, uh, recognizable by Turing machine uh, is recognizable by a two-way 
uh, Turing machine. Is it just because like you can just get rid of the second way and then just yes, keep it exactly, on exactly. Direction? One idea is like the, the two-way Turing machine obviously is a generalization of the one-way Turing machine. So certainly everything decidable by uh, excuse me, everything recognizable by a Turing machine has to be recognizable by a two-way Turing machine. However, the simulation for this to be correct needs one additional sentence. Given a two, there may be a Turing machine that is poorly programmed and relies on uh, trying to move left when it shouldn't. So the definition we gave, and there are different definitions, the definition we gave, though, is a Turing machine on the leftmost cell, the one-way one tape, one tape. If it's on the leftmost cell and it tries to move uh, left, it's just going to stay. It's just going to not be able to move left. It's going to stay right there. There might be a Turing machine which relies on this to compute something. So what we can do is modify. We need to modify the simulation slightly for that case. If there's a poorly programmed Turing machine, we still need to be able to show it's, uh, it works on a two-way Turing machine in a way that now this undefined behavior is now defined and does something and we don't want it to. So how would you simulate correctly a one-way tape Turing machine on a two-way tape Turing machine? This is also kind of an arbitrary. It's not super important that we know how to do this, but it, it is a little arbitrary. But it, it's an interesting kind of puzzle to think about. What if we just attached all the states before the K0 to the very end? So then it's just like a one-way. And then you can just copy it over. That is simulating a two-way on a one-way, which, which is actually the more important direction. But we're going to get to, well, first we want to show, we want to show this one. So take an element from here and put it in here. Wait, so we want to show like a regular Turing machine can be simulated on a two-way Turing machine? Yes. And it's obvious why it can be, but I want a sentence on why. If you just make all the states before um, Q0, I guess, dummy states that just lead back to Q0. That. Yeah, exactly. So instead of states, though, cells of the tape. Basically, like, um, oh, okay. so like we were able to test in a PDA the stack was empty or not by adding a canary. And if we saw the canary ever, we knew the stack was empty. We're going to do that, basically. We're going to add a canary. So add a canary. So it's going to look like what? Oh, this is our... Sorry, these markers are all terrible. Every single one. Right. So let's say we add a canary and then move right. So let's say we're here. And if we ever read the canary, we're just going to force ourselves to move right. So add a self loop. If you read the canary, that means you are beyond the tape. You tried to move off the tape. So you're going to write the canary back and then move right. That makes sense? So let's say you're here, you're doing whatever, doing your math, and then you come here, and then your program is poor, your Turing machine is poorly programmed. It tries to move left where it a bunch that it shouldn't. So let's say it reads the canary. And then you just move right. Exactly. Okay. Just force ourselves back there. That correctly should simulate the, uh, the thing. Now let's think about the harder way. So I claim that although this is, a, it, 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 so we've now just shown that the two-way Turing machine is more powerful than the Turing machine, but is it strictly more powerful? We don't think so. And what we're going to prove is that uh, any language recognizable by a two-way Turing machine must also be recognizable by a Turing machine. And this was the original, the, the, the important question actually. Isn't this just because you said like integers and natural numbers? Both of those are countably infinite. So both yes. of them should have like, even if it's two ways or whatever, they should have like the same amount of cells, basically. Uh, that is reasonable intuition. But if we were coming to an argument about it, uh -oh. what would the we the, argue, the correctest, most convincing way to say, oh, countably many registers or whatever? It's not obvious to me why that is why the fact that they're both, the, the, the space alloc 
the space device being countable, countably infinite means that they must be equivalent. I, I agree, but I don't have an intuitive reason why I should agree. Um, the more correct, like convincing argument is to convert any two-way Turing machine to a one-way, such that we don't disturb uh, the way it says yes or no, right? So if this recognizes some language, that language is also in here, because there's another Turing machine to recognize the language. So I'm giving you a two-way Turing machine, so the tape goes both ways. How can we convert this to a Turing machine where the tape only goes one way? And there are also many good answers for this, so if you think of it. The suggestion that in earlier work, the one where you just take like all the cells before Q0, and then you just append it to the end, and then you try. So you're saying take the negative half of the tape yeah. and append it where? To the very end of the positive end. Ah, so like over here? Yeah. But the tape is infinite. infinite. So, okay, so that makes there is an idea there, though. You want to somehow overlap the tape. So there's a few creative solutions you could do. Uh, one people have mentioned was something like you alternate, right? Think of a bijection between the integers and the naturals. Just do the same thing here. Like space each, use only the even cells to simulate the odd portion of the tape, and the even, use the odd cells to simulate the, the, the left half, and the even cells to simulate the right half, something like this. And then you have to modify your transition function in a way. Um, here's the, here's the, an interesting idea, certainly, and basically, uh, you're going to fold the tape in half. So, if you have a tape that looks like, um, I don't know why I decided to draw it curvy, but let's say it goes like that. What you're going to do is fold it in half. So let's say these are cells, right? So if this was like, I don't know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, these would have come from like A, B, C, D, E, G, F, H. Something like this, right? So you would fold the tape this way. Um, and just to give one more picture of what I mean by fold, Mm -hmm. Exactly. So your gamma here, your tape alphabet, is actually going to be gamma squared, and you're going to rate this as all pairs, A over B, uh, A, B. So even if this was like any directional, you could just make the language, like, so if it was like four direction, I, I don't really know how four directional tapes would look, or something like that. You could just make it into like gamma to the fourth, and then just... Yeah, there. sure, certainly, certainly. So um, what's important here, though, is that the Turing machine definition, what changes in the Turing machine definition? We changed the alphabet. It's still finite, but we've changed the alphabet. So it's the difference between using binary for a computer and using base 32, really. Um, the, we need one sentence on how the simulation works, though. So if the machine was moving, let's suppose it was moving right to left. Okay, It should do that infinitely. What we're going to do is have the transition only modify either the, uh, modify the tops, and then when it reaches the end, we tell it to switch and start looping. Every left becomes a right, and it's going to start moving this way and only modify the bottoms. Right? So if we originally had, like, uh, in our, in our two-way, if we had, like, read A, write B, move right, we would have, in our TM, we would have read A over A, write A over B, write A over, uh, write B over A, move right, read A over B, Right, B over B, move right, 
and read A over blank, right? B over blank. Um, move right, right? So basically, these instructions effectively ignore the bottom half of the symbol, and we only modify the top half of the symbol, right? So that's the way this works. We're going to read this A, write a B, move this way, but not touch the bottom half. So using this little trick, we can simulate the two-way tape on the one-way tape. And in fact, some books define the Turing machine to start with the two-way infinite tape, but it turns out the one-way infinite tape is, is it's simpler, certainly, certainly. Okay, so we've now done two generalizations of the Turing machine, and we failed to show uh, that they were stronger, because they're, in fact, not. So what is a two-way tape if not really just two tapes, right? So we're going to define uh, something very related, which is called a K-tape Turing machine. And it looks like this. So we're going to have a tape. We have a tape. Uh, you're going to have a tape. So instead of one tape, you now have K tape, where K is a fixed finite amount. And you have a bunch of independent heads that can read and write and move. And here's your Turing machine. Right. So it has access to K tapes. It can read and write to move them, move on them. And that's what the picture of the K tape Turing machine looks like. A two tape Turing machine is basically like a K tape. It's basically like, a, excuse me, a two, uh, a bidirectional Turing machine, a two way Turing machine is basically kind of like two tapes, right? It's like there's almost like there's twice as much, but like you said, countably is the same, so it doesn't matter. Um, they're both countably infinite. So what this device, uh, but instead we allow it to have finitely many more tapes, K tapes. It can read and write to them at any moment. Uh, we would define the transition function like this. So it's at some state. Uh, instead of reading one symbol, now you, move, you read K symbols. Um, you move to a new state. Now you write K distinct symbols. And then the head is allowed to move left or right, or even let's just allow it to stay, whatever, it doesn't matter, uh, k times. It's allowed to make k uh, move. So each head moves independently. But each head moves conditionally on whatever the other heads are reading as well. This is the definition of a k-tape Turing machine. So obviously, this is a generalization of the Turing machine. So Every language recognizable by a Turing machine happens to be recognizable by a uh, K-tape Turing machine. Why? You mean K1? OK, yeah. <laughs> Suppose K wasn't 1. Let's say K was 7. Fix K for this. That's true, obviously. But why is, uh, uh, so. In everyone, this is, I'm trying to train the intuition here. We all have the intuition, like, if there's more of something, you just don't use it. Obviously, that works. But I'm, I'm curious, I'm asking for what would you, how would you prove it, the, you, the way you ignore it? So suppose K is 7. We have a 7-tape Turing machine. I want you to simulate a 1-tape Turing machine on a K-tape Turing machine. Yes? Can't you just make all the tapes, just the one tape from the Turing machine? There's a simpler way. But that would work actually just fine. Well, well, that's again the reverse direction. So we're doing the easy way this time. Yeah, we're doing the easy way this time. I have a one tape. We're doing, given a language recognizable by a one tape Turing machine, I want you to show that there exists a K tape Turing machine to also recognize that language. You just don't use the others. I yes. Mean, yeah. But. An additional sentence on the formality of how you would perform that simulation. Oh, what if you just added like a canary to the beginning of every other tape except for the one tape that you use? And then if you see that canary, you just go back to the other tape. Or so like, each head, okay. and this is not obvious, each head moves independently. They move, they can move left or right by themselves. 
So you just have it stay on the canary. Yes, exactly. So the input goes on the first tape. The rest of the tapes just stay blank. And then just do whatever you would do on the first tape. All the other tapes are just going to stay. Read, write, stay. OK, that's the answer. Oh. So just ignore all of the tapes. Uh, I wanted to be slightly pedantic about this one. Um, so obviously, the K-tape Turing machine is a generalization of the Turing machine. Uh, and it's actually a very useful generalization of the Turing machine. We, it may be convenient for us to have multiple tapes if we're talking about something practically. If we're, it, like you have multiple drives or multiple data structures or whatever. right? You want to keep your things distinctly separated. Uh, I also claim, though, that this generalization fails to be stronger and that every language recognizable by a K-tape Turing machine happens to be recognizable by a Turing machine. So this time, I'm asking you for a language recognizable by a K-tape Turing machine. Prove that there exists an, a one-tape Turing machine to perform the same simulation, to perform the same computation. Yes? Can't you just make it into a K-tuple and then run the same algorithm that we did on the Two tape. Oh, right. So like, like basically what we did here. Yeah. The difference between this one and this one, though, and I, the reason I've introduced this difference, is that the K heads can move independently. Oh. So here, they would be forced to move at the same. Here, they may be in different positions. Subtle, subtle unnecessary even difference, because church strength thesis, these all models are, end up being the same. But why is this? How would you? This? So obviously, if, the, if we restricted the heads to be in the same position at once, we got rid of this k, for example, and everything moved left or right simultaneously. Uh, that would obviously be turning. Comp uh, that, that would obviously be equivalent because you can do the same compress compression trick. I'm asking though, what about if we uh, relax the tape heads to be independent? And now the problem. It's still true that we can perform the simulation, but for a hard. But it's actually harder to, to argue why we can do this. So given a K-tape Turing machine where the heads may move independently, how can we simulate this on one tape Turing, a one-tape Turing machine? This part is not obvious. This part is hard. Unlike the last two where they're kind of, there's some intuition here, it's not obvious you can do this. Are the K-tapes like different tapes? Yes. And they're all infinitely long in one way. OK, I'll tell you guys the answer. Basically, uh, put all K tapes on one tape sequentially. Is it because k times like the natural numbers is still countable? So, sure. Another idea here is that at any moment, so understand that the Turing machine initializes with a finite input on its tape, even though the tape is infinite. It doesn't. The Turing machine never uses the infinite part of its tape in a useful way. At any moment, it has only used a finite amount of tape. If a Turing machine takes finitely many steps, suppose it takes 10 steps, okay? The Turing machine cannot use more than 10 cells of tape in 10 steps. So the number of space always used, if a Turing machine halts, the space used by the Turing machine is always finite. So at any given moment, the Turing machine has only used a finite amount of space. So what we're going to do is, um, let's say gamma was something simple. Gamma was like A, B, blank. Right, that sounds reasonable. We're going to say gamma dot is um, a b blank, but then a dot, a b dot, and blank dot. Now, what is a dot? A dotted symbol is just a different symbol, but it, it allows us to keep track of. A, it allows us to mark in a way that we can remember. So you can mark a symbol. We marked a symbol last time by putting an x, but that allowed us to forget what the symbol was. 
Here, by putting a mark, we can just remember the symbol. So if we have a transition like, let's say we read the A, mark the A with a dot, and move right, left, doesn't matter, okay? This is just reading and writing two different symbols, but effectively it's as if we remembered the symbol and just marked it, right? That's what this uh, gamma dot does. Now what we're going to do is initialize our one tape Turing machine like this. Right, so recall that uh, the Turing machine begins with the input written on the tape, does some computation, and then accepts or rejects. Forget the part where the Turing machine computes and returns an answer, just for, think about it saying yes or no. So in a K-tape Turing machine, the answer would be written on the first tape and the rest of the tapes would be allocated to be blank. What we're going to do is put this string on our, on our one-way tape, okay? The dots are going to simulate uh, the positions of the tape heads. So instead of writing out like a detailed paragraph about how the simulation works, I think I'll just say it out loud so I don't have to use all these words. Uh, let the K tape Turing machine make one step of the make one step. Our, so the K tape machine makes one step. The heads move arbitrarily left and right or whatever. We're going to simulate that one step on our one tape Turing machine uh, the same way. So basically, whatever that we would do, we go uh, compartment by compartment and update the tape in the same way it would. So if the Turing machine on the second tape moves left, we would take this part of the tape and move, le and insert, uh, move left. But at any point, if we need more space, we pause the simulation, insert sufficient blanks, and then resume the simulation. Would you believe that we could write such a Turing machine? Slightly, compu slightly complicated. It's not obvious from a state diagram perspective how we would even perform those actions. But just to repeat myself, we have a K-tape Turing machine. We want, to, we want to simulate it on a one-tape Turing machine. The way we do this is we append all the K tapes back to back. And the only reason we can do this is because at any moment, the Turing machine has only used a finite amount of space, right? When the K tape Turing machine performs one action, one computation step, one move of its transition function, we simulate that on each compartment. So what this K tape Turing machine takes one time, one step, unit step, we're gonna take at least linearly number of steps because we're gonna loop over the input and make the modifications uh, properly. And when we see a delimiter, we know that's the end of that uh, tape. At any moment, if we need more space during the section of the tape, we pause the simulation, insert blanks, shift everything appropriately, go back to where we were and resume the simulation. That is how the simulation occurs. Not obvious how you would do this, but certainly uh, you can. So what you're saying is like, you just split every step of the K-tape into like, multiple steps of the one way, and you just... Absolutely, absolutely. It turns out that the K-tape Turing machine, uh, so we're in the unit of computability theory. So we don't care about efficiency. We only care about possibility. We just care about if something is possible at all. And it turns out that, the, that by showing this, anything possible on the K-tape Turing machine is possible on the one-tape Turing machine. Um, but from an efficiency standpoint, it turns out, and we'll prove it, that the K-tape Turing machine is much more efficient than the one-tape Turing machine. Turing machine is, the one-tape Turing machine is actually quite limited in terms of its efficiency uh, to do things. But it turns out it's not limited in its ability. It just might take a while, but it'll still do it. It'll still be correct. So this concludes the proof that the K-tape Turing machine is... Uh, equivalent to the one tape one. We gave a generalization, a final generalization of a Turing machine, and we failed to, uh, 
We failed to show it was strictly stronger uh, because we were able to show it was simulatable on a normal Turing machine. Therefore, they could only be the same. So there's two more generalizations I'm going to do. Can you guys guess one of them? Using the things we've done in this class so far, what is one, if I asked you to give a general, if I asked you, if you didn't know the Turing machine was the strongest model of real computation, and I asked you to give a model of computation to strengthen the Turing machine, what is one way you might intuitively want to make it super powered? Open-ended question on this one. Could like make the languages. If it can what? Make the languages. So we need to stay in the framework of deciding and recognizing, oh. just for the sake of talking about set theory, right? Set theory uh, using the language of set theory to talk about something being stronger than the other. Um, and in, and in fact, this one computer that I'm thinking of uh, is actually tricky if you consider it as a computing device and not as an acceptor or a rejector. So this is the one example I think that might not work. As, a, as, a, as an acceptor, as a, as, a comp, as a producing device. What is something we've, known, we've learned in this class so far that um, seems powerful? PDA. PDA. Human brain. Human brain. So the thing is, though, both of those are less powerful than... Uh, what is it? What is it, and it, it I'm being, a, again, pedantic here. It's not important at all that I'm doing this bit. What is a limitation of the current Turing machine? What is the definition of the Turing machine? You can only write one time. You can write one time. OK. So I guess, I guess the answer I'm fishing for is that no matter what it does, no matter any generalizations we've shown so, shown so far, all of those are deterministic actions. So why not just consider the non-deterministic Turing machine? So can I spell it? Uh, very interesting in its own right as well, NTM. So recall that the Turing machine uh, uh, transition function looked like this. Delta takes on a state, it takes on, it reads a symbol, and then it moves to a new state, writes a symbol, and moves left to right. Uh, what is the NTM's transition function? It's going to read a, it's going to read a symbol, excuse me, start at a state, read a symbol, move to a new state, write a symbol, and move left to right. But we want it to move to multiple, uh, we want it to be able to move to multiple states, right, through multiple transitions. So what we're going to do is we're going to allow this to be the power set. All this is going to do is allow uh, multiple outgoing transitions on the same read. So like if we were at some QI, we see an A, we, maybe we choose to write an A and move left. Or uh, we see an A, we choose to write a B and move right. Both of those uh, are valid now in a uh, non-deterministic Turing machine, which are, you can't have this in a deterministic Turing machine, right? What happens if you're at QI and you read an A? Uh, if you're QI and you read an A, you go to both. Non-determinism. So this is the definition of a non-deterministic Turing machine. Uh, why is it true that every language recognizable by a Turing machine is recognizable by a non-deterministic Turing machine? Just don't use those extra states. Yeah, basically. Like, by the generalization of non-determinism, every DFA was an NFA by just not having non-deterministic transitions. Uh, a non-deterministic computer does not need to have non-deterministic transitions. It's just that it can have those, right? 
I should maybe more formally define the non-deterministic Turing machine, like, you know, one except, when, if there exists an accepting computation, accepts, right? Because now it's allowed to do multiple things. Um, very, very complicated, very ugly. So obviously, though, everything decidable by, everything recognizable by a Turing machine is recognizable by a non-deterministic Turing machine. You build the non-deterministic Turing machine by just copying the Turing machine over and just calling it non-deterministic. It just doesn't use a superpower, right? It has a superpower, it doesn't use it, fine. This generalization is obvious. Here is the one that we care about, though. Uh, it's not true, though, that the non-deterministic Turing machine is strictly stronger. We are going to fail for the fourth time to generalize the definition of a Turing machine. Uh, it, tr it turns out that the non-deterministic Turing machine is equivalent to the Turing machine. What I want to do now is prove this. The way we're going to do it is take a non-deterministic Turing machine and simulate it on a deterministic Turing machine. So we were able to simulate a NFA on a DFA using the power set construction. The NFA used finitely many states, and we were able to simulate every superposition of those states by its own state, because there's finitely many. Two to the finitely many is still finitely many. The Turing machine is more complicated, because at any moment, it has an, the instantaneous descriptions can be obvious or terribly long. You can, so you can't do something like that. But how, I want, let's take a minute to think about how you, you simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine deterministically. This is not an easy answer. It's not, I don't expect uh, we're going to get it by saying it out loud in the first minute. But let's think about it. Just to rephrase, the question is, I want you to give me a deterministic one-tape Turing machine to simulate uh, the non-deterministic Turing machine. Can we do it the same way that we made a NFA into a DFA, where we, like, make every cell that it could be on? That turns out not to work for very complicated reasons. Each state of the NFA simulates a superposition of states of the DFA. Excuse me, every state of that, of that DFA simulates a superposition of the states of the NFA, every possible set of states. However, when you're in on a, on a non-deterministic Turing machine taking some action, not only do you have to keep track of the new the set of possible states you're in, but you have to keep track of the set of possible symbols you can write. So it turns out you can't just do a power set style construction to convert a non-deterministic Turing machine to a deterministic one. This is actually not an easy question. It's not obvious it's possible. Um, so what is a non-deterministic computation? What is a deterministic computation? If you're at some configuration, in a deterministic computation, there's only one next configuration, right? Right. So, like, if you consider the the computation of a deterministically, it looks like this, right? You, there's always one next thing to do deterministically, uh, exactly one next thing to do. But a non-deterministic computation, as a graph, may look like this. So the graph may have some non-deterministic actions in it. This is not the um, machine itself. This is a view of, this is what's called the configuration graph. Each, the configuration graph of a deterministic or non-deterministic machine is a rooted, is a rooted tree such that uh, every state corresponds to a configuration of the machine, a potential state snapshot of the machine, and you draw an arrow if this configuration, uh, this configuration follows from this configuration after one application of the transition function, right? So a deterministic Turing machine only has this as a possibility. There's only one next possible configuration for any computation. The non-deterministic Turing machine has a picture that looks like this. This is the configuration graph. This is the initial configuration. So it's going to look like Q0, W1, WN, right? And then from there, each, each uh, state corresponds to some configuration of the graph. The, if a machine is deterministic, its configuration graph is going to look like a line. It's not deterministic, it's a tree. Um, the reason I'm mentioning this is the way our deterministic simulator is going to work is it's going to, our de we want to deterministically simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine. The way we're going to do that is just take the graph, build the graph, and 
search for an accepting computation. If we find the accepting computation, then the non-deterministic machine had to accept that word, which means we will also accept. If we find a rejecting computation, if we only find rejecting computations, then of course we must reject as well. Uh, recall that a non-deterministic computation accepts if it exists an accepting computation path. Right. Let's say this one was the accepting computation path. So we're going to perform graph search uh, to find the accepting computation. What are some graph search algorithms that you guys know? DFS. So what we're going to do is the Turing machine, the deterministic Turing machine, is going to look at a snapshot, uh, compute, use the transition function of the non-deterministic Turing machine, compute the next possible snapshot, and then proceed that way. Uh, there's a problem with this, though, with using DFS. If you use DFS instead. Right. But what's the limitation of DFS first? So what if, let's say, uh, this was the accepting computation path. Let's say there was just immediately an accept state. But if you perform DFS, uh, you could, there might be a branch of the non-deterministic Turing machine which infinitely loops. So you could go down, a path, and the graph, configuration graph, if the machine loops on some inputs, the graph will be infinite. Right. So if you go down some path with DFS, it's possible you miss the easy exit, but you are still busy searching down there somewhere with DFS. So DFS, not the good idea here. BFS is the good idea. So BFS is breadth for a search. DFS is depth for a search. I have to say this out loud just to make sure everyone knows. But DFS, you go down first, come back up once you reach an end. BFS, you kind of like bleed through the graph. Right. You guys remember how to implement... BFS, what was the data structure for BFS? Uh, it was a Q. So just to give you a quick picture on how BFS works, um, let's say you have a graph that looks like this. Just a refresher. Uh, you have a graph that looks like this. The way BFS works is you start at the root, uh, you pop from the, from the uh, like our Q or priority Q, uh, you pop from the queue and you push its children. So the queue is going to look like, it's going to look empty at first. You're going to start with the root. You're going to pop off the queue and push its children. So S comes out and you append at the end its children. And here, the way I'm representing the queue is that the leftmost element in the queue is the one with the highest priority. That's when we're going to pop off. And when we push its children, we're going to pin them to the end. So opposite of a stack. Uh, now, what, what am I going to do? I see A. I'm going to pop A and push its children. C. So it's going to be B, C. Pop B, push its children. It has no children. Pop C, push its children. No children. The order of the nodes visited here was S, uh, A, B, C. So we went here, then we went here, here, and then we went here. Right. So when, what happens with BFS is you go through several depths of the, of the computer, and that's exactly the way we want to view non-determinism. We, first, we look at all computations that happen after one step, all computations that happen after two steps, all computations that happen after three steps, and so on. And the BFS, if you think of it, it's like, kind of like a sliding window of the depth through the tree. Um, so this, although I've been quite expository here, this is an algorithm and not a Turing machine. Turns out those will be the same, but... Uh, by the church Turing thesis, but I'm asking for a Turing machine. So we need to give a little bit more explicitly on uh, how that would work. And what we're going to do is just use the tape as the cue. So perform uh, a BFS on the configuration graph. Uh, looking for accepting configuration. If we find a rejecting con uh, configuration, we sort of ignore it. Wow, it's more frequent. If we find a rejecting configuration, we just ignore it and keep pushing the other things. 
If there is a branch of the computation of the machine which infinitely loops, uh, so will we. We'll continue traversing down that infinitely loop path. If we find an accepting computation, great, we stop everything and we accept. Um, the way we're going to use the tape like a queue is just kind of do this. We're going to say, like, um, the tape is going to be initialized like this. Right? And what we're going to do is we don't even need to ne necessarily erase it. Here, during the queue, we pop it. So the head goes here. Instead, what we're going to do is read the configuration, compute using the transition function of the non-deterministic Turing machine, um, compute all possible next configurations, and then append those. So for example, if our non-deterministic Turing machine was like this, let's say we read w1, write a, move right. If we read w2, write, excuse me, read w1 and write b, and move right, qi, qj. Suppose that was some non-deterministic branch. What we're going to do then is the next state of our, of our tape is going to look like this. I'll make this clear. It's like tape head, w1, dot, 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 wn. We're going to go... So what happens here, you read w1, write a or b, and move right. So this is going to be A, Q, I, W, 2, dot, 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 W, N, B, Q, J, W, 2, dot, 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 W, N. And you're going to move the head to the last one you pushed, which would be here. Something like this. So like an evolving, evolving and marching on Q, basically. So this is the um, non-deterministic Turing machine. It turns out it's equivalent to the deterministic Turing machine. One quick expository thing is that anything decidable or recognizable by a non-deterministic Turing machine, we've proven is recognizable or decidable by a deterministic one. So in some sense, non-determinism gives no power with respect to possibility. However, and we'll talk about this much later, uh, the classes uh, of in complexity P and NP are uh, formulated using Turing machines. P corresponds to the class of languages decidable by a Turing machine, and you say the Turing machine moves in, a, in polynomially many steps. NP doesn't stand for not polynomial. It's just all you do is replace the word deterministic with non-deterministic. So this is the class of languages decidable by a non-deterministic Turing machine, which halts in a polynomial number of steps. Um, the term, we've proven that the class of languages decidable by a Turing machine is equivalent to the class of languages decidable by a non-deterministic Turing machine. So, but P versus NP is an open problem. The only difference between what we've just proven and P versus NP is the restrict, is, is the space, excuse me, the time restriction. In some sense, we were able to simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine deterministically, but what was the cost of that? That is bad. It's actually very bad. This, BFS is linear time, but over the size of the graph. Graph can be exponentially, exponentially large. So the simulation is actually quite expensive, but it's possible. We're, we care about possibility in this unit. But I'm just, I'm just alluding to the fact that if you make even a slight restriction on this question, it turns out to be very difficult. This is a very, uh, a very difficult question. Okay, let's take our little break, and we'll come back.